The text for tonight is 1 Chronicles 11, verse 22 to 25. And that's a rare passage because it's one that's so important that it's reproduced almost word for word in 2 Samuel 23, verse 20. And that's something that rarely happens in the Bible, that a text or some verses are reproduced in another section of the Bible. Benaiah, son of Jehoiada, was a valiant fighter from Kabzeel who performed great exploits. He struck down two of Moab's best men. He also went down into a pit on a snowy day and killed a lion. And he struck down an Egyptian who was seven and a half feet tall. Although the Egyptian had a spear like a weaver's rod in his hand, Benaiah went against him with a club. He snatched the spear from the Egyptian's hand and killed him with his own spear. Such were the exploits of Benaiah, son of Jehoiada. He, too, was as famous as the three mighty men. He was held in greater honor than any of the thirty, but he was not included among the three. And David put him in charge of his bodyguard. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. You know, I think, of David's three mighty men. They were three generals who were part of his personal bodyguard. And they had performed deeds of valor in the kingdom of Israel. And their names appear earlier in this chapter. They are Joab, Joshobim, and Eliezer. And then there was also a wider group of 30 who were made up David's wider bodyguard. And Benaiah was over these 30 men. Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada. And he had done, as you see in this passage, three deeds of valor. The first one was he had slain two men of Moab. The second one, he had slain a lion in a pit on a snowy day. And the third one was he had killed an Egyptian, a man of great stature. It was the size of Goliath, and he had slew him with his own spear. And because of this, Benaiah had won a name of valor in Israel. Now, what possible application does that have to us? This story from the Old Testament, what possible application? The key is given, I think, by the Apostle Paul when he said, all things were written aforetime, for our instruction. And in another place he said, they happened as types or examples for us. These stories were written down for our admonition and for our instruction. And the glory of the Old Testament is that God moved in the history of Israel and in the daily events of their lives, and that provides a picture of what God is doing in our spiritual lives today. Remember, these three incidents have to do with Moabites, lions, and Egyptians. And these three are types or pictures of things in our own experience. And the picture is of the world, the flesh, and the devil. The world, the flesh, and the devil. Egypt is a picture of the world, the pressure, the allurement, and the bondage of the world. Israel's yearning for Egypt after they had left is a picture of the Christians yearning for pleasure, to return to the worldly pastimes and occupations, the spirit of the world. The lion is the picture of the devil. The New Testament tells us That our enemy, our adversary, goes about as a roaring lion, seeking who he may destroy. That's the devil. And Moab is used as a picture of the flesh in the Old Testament. That self-centered, 
bent within us, that's constantly plaguing us and turning us to ourselves. So the three deeds of valor that were accomplished by Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, are a picture of a man who has conquered the world, the flesh, and the devil. You'll find in Lord's Day 52, at the conclusion of the Heidelberg Catechism, the same three references, the world, the flesh, and the devil, we read there are our sworn enemies. They never stop attacking us. You know, the devil with his ability to masquerade and to deceive nations, to invade and infiltrate our daily experiences with his subtle and deceiving lies, the world with its pressure to conform, to be like everyone else, to act like everyone else, think like everyone else, to never be different. Those are the pressures of the world. And the flesh, that subtle twisting of our inner desires to lead us to always rationalize our sins, to justify our evil, to cover up, to seek ways to appear to be upright and sanctified and sanctimonious, but to be actually inwardly given over to the things of the flesh. We're going to focus on the central one of these events tonight, the lion. How to kill a lion on a snowy day. And we'll see that that is our problem. When Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, met this lion, was the worst possible foe, a lion. It's not for nothing, you know, that a lion is called the king of beasts. It's a vicious, powerful animal. There was a missionary, David Livingstone, who carried to death the marks of a lion's jaw on his shoulder blade where he had been attacked. And his body, in fact, was identified after death as that of the missionary by the marks of the lion's jaw in his shoulder. It is said that lions can crush with one bite any human bone in the body or one swipe of their paw. They can crush any human bone. I once heard of the fight between a tiger and a lion, and a tiger is a vicious animal as well, when the lion suddenly swiped the tiger's head and crushed it. A lion is a formidable enemy, and Benaiah met the worst possible foe. You know, you have a lion in your life. What's the worst possible foe you have? Something you're dreading. Some situation, some circumstance, some cloud over your life. You've wondered and thought perhaps it's just around the corner. Something you feared, dreaded, not wanted to face. Some illness, injury, sickness. You've lived with certain people in certain circumstances. There's something you don't want to face. And yet it looms as a possibility all the time. The worst possible foe. We all have one, don't we? Don't we all have one of those? A lion in your life. And it fills our hearts with dread as we come to grips with facing a formidable enemy like that, that lion. But notice that Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, met his lion at the worst possible place, in a pit, a pit of all places. If I ever meet a lion, I hope that it's in a place where I can run and get away and not in a pit. I'd like to have the ability to run. Reminds me of the story of the young man who was caught stealing watermelon one night, and the owner took a shot at him. And the next day, his friend said to him, Did you hear those shots? Did I hear them? I said, I heard them twice. Once when they passed me, and the second time when I passed them. That's the way I want to be if I meet a lion, somewhere where I can run and get away. 
But in a pit where Benaiah met his lion, you can't escape. There was no way for him to avoid this lion. No place for him to hide. You ever felt like that? Something you'd love to run away from, but you can't do it? No place to escape, no place to get away from it. Circumstances have you hemmed in. You've got to face up to this and you know it. There's no way that you're going to get away from it. Something to do with home, work, school perhaps. But you can't escape from this pit. You meet your lion in the worst possible place. And I noticed that Benaiah not only met this lion in the worst possible place, but he met it under the worst possible circumstance, in a pit on a day when snow had fallen or on a snowy day. You know, and snow can be fun. A lot of people like it. A lot of people don't care much for it. But you can imagine what snow does to a man in a battle with a beast, a lion, in a pit. Can't run away, very likely could impair his vision, make his footing very slippery, perhaps the numbing cold would make it difficult for him to hang on to his weapons. This man, Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, met his lion in a pit on a snowy day. He had earned a proper name of valor in Israel by overcoming all of these tremendous obstacles. He met a lion, the worst possible foe, in the worst possible place, under the worst possible circumstances. And that's what you and I have That thing in your life that you can't get away from, it's coming. You've got to face it. Someday, somewhere, sometime. And it may come under the worst possible circumstances when everything seems to fall apart at once and nothing looks right. You have a sense of fear and abandonment. It seems at those times as though God has left you, and you wonder what's wrong. Your heart cries out with questions, questions that come at times like that. Now what do you do? Many people are defeated. Many crumble. Many can't take it. Often those circumstances are where we lose our testimony in the eyes of our neighbor's And friends. And the challenge of the day in which we live, in which those kinds of hours and those evil days come very frequently, is that we have to learn to live in victory in those moments. This man is here to teach us how to do it. Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, slew a lion in a pit on a snowy day. How did he do it? What's his secret? You know, it doesn't do us any good just to tell us that he did it. It doesn't do any good to hold up his example. You know, after all, we admire the example, but that doesn't really help us. What's the secret? The Word of God tells us. doesn't leave us wondering. The answer is here. But like many deep and wonderful truths of the Word of God, it's hidden. But it is here. You know, to be Bible students, you often have to read the Bible like Perry Mason, looking for clues in a detective mystery. One of the Proverbs says, It is the glory of God to conceal a thing, and the glory of kings is to search it out. Have you been a royal Bible student Kings searching out the hidden truths of God, the things that God has hidden. Well, the secret of victory here is in this passage, and the secret lay in the man himself. 
in his relationship to his God. It's because Benaiah was who he was that he could do a thing like this. Anyone else in that pit, I think, would certainly have been killed immediately. But here was a man who knew how to handle it. And the secret of how to handle it is in the man's name, in his name. The name stands for the individual, often in Scripture. The secret of a man is hidden in his name in Scripture. Notice how often that's true. Look, for instance, at the two children of Isaiah. They're found in Isaiah 7 and 8. You don't have to look right now. But they had unusual jawbreaker names, the children of Isaiah. And they were named because God told Isaiah to name them, to be a testimony to Israel. First one was Maher Shalal Hashbaz. Maher Shalal Hashbaz. Can you imagine calling that kid to lunch? The name like that? But it means speed to the spoil and haste to the prey. And it was God's way of saying to his people, there's trouble coming, there's trouble ahead, the enemy is coming to speed to the spoil and haste to the prey. But the other boy's name was Shear Jeshub, and that means a remnant shall return. So that every time they looked at these two boys, Israel had a message from God. The name of the oldest man is a message from God like that too. That's why he lived, I think, to be the oldest man who ever lived. His name had significance. Methuselah. And that means when he dies, it will come. When you get home, you check Genesis. The year Methuselah died, the flood came. It was 969 years of God's grace. And he was constantly saying by his name, when I die, it will come. And it did come. This man's name, Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, and that's the way it is used most often in the, this text, is Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, also has significance. Both of those names have significance. Let's take a look at those. First of all, the father's name, Jehoiada, means God knows. God knows. Put that in your situation. When you have to meet your worst possible foe in the worst possible place under the worst possible circumstances, how do you come through to victory? How do you demonstrate the power of God to keep you safe under the most distressing of circumstances? How? First, remind yourself, God knows. God knows. In this scientific age, you know, we are often told there is no God. God is dead. Sometimes told that we have no need of God. And some people have felt like that. Is that true? Is it true that we are caught up in a chance universe? It has no meaning that we are simply cogs in a wheel? What is the answer to that? Well, as you know, our Lord himself said, we live in a universe with our Father in heaven. Around us are the everlasting arms of our Father. Our Father's heart is concerned about us. He numbers the very hairs of our head. He knows the days of our life. He knows the circumstances of under which we live, and what we're going through. We are exposed each moment to our Father's heart, 
who is concerned for us. God knows. God knows. Isn't that a comfort in these days of pressure? When there's catastrophe that strikes on every side, that numbs us. When we hear about things happening in this world that make us wonder, what is this world coming to? We hear of forces that are seemingly out of control in our streets. Isn't it always an eternal comfort to know God knows? God knows. But that's not all. The second name is necessary as well. Benaiah. God builds. God builds. Yes, God knows, but that's not all. God also builds. God is moving on a plan. He's building to a purpose. He has a reason. He's accomplishing something. What happens to you is on the road to that accomplishment. The very circumstances in which you find yourself, this moment of pressure, this deep distress of heart, this fearsome encounter is part of God's program to bring you to this goal he has in mind. God is building God has a purpose. God moves to that end, not only in the whole of human history, but in your life, your individual life as well. And that's what wins victory. That's what gives victory in this situation, in these kinds of encounters. When we tremble, when our hearts are overcome with fear, when we face these terrible foes in this day and age in which we live, what brings us to victory is the experience in the midst of pressure of these twin truths. God knows and God builds. He has a purpose for it, that lion in your life, and therefore we accept that purpose. We don't gripe or grumble or give way or worry or grow anxious, but we trust that he'll bring us through. And that's the secret of how to kill a lion in a pit on a snowy day. God knows and God builds. And therefore, you can go through this. And you know he will bring you safely out. God is calling us to be a visible manifestation of the delivering power of God right where we are, to be the salt of the earth. And when you do, you'll gain a name of valor in Israel. There's a list of them in Hebrews 11. Remember, would you like to have your name there also? Let me close with these thoughts. When you are neglected or snubbed or insulted and you're able to thank God for the experience, accepting it as allowed by him for your spiritual development, that is victory. When you're seeking to serve him faithfully and find yourself criticize severely for the way you do it and you accept criticism patiently for his sake, that is victory. When you're slandered and your motives are impugned and you do not complain, but you receive it in love and as a measure of the filling up of that which is behind the affliction of Christ, that is is victory. Such victory can only be won by the yielding of self to Christ. Thanks be to God who causes us to triumph through our Lord Jesus Christ who gives us the victory. 
Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for giving us this example from your holy scripture. We pray that you will help us to remember these truths that God knows. God knows what is happening in our life, whether it seems as though it's for our good or not. God knows, and God will build. God is building. He has a purpose in this for us. And if we remember those truths as we go through this life, then God will give us the victory as well. Be with us now. In Jesus' name.